welcome to This Is Horror Arc Party Edition. We are going to be talking to Max Booth. And today I've got my co host, Rob Olson, formerly of Booked Podcast, now of Arc Party. Rob, tell us a little bit about yourself and the Arc Party concept. Sure. Um, so I have been doing podcasts uh, since April of 2011. Primarily, I was doing book reviews and author interviews. And <laughs> um, that was with Booked. Booked ended uh, in the in our 10th year, on our 10th anniversary, we ended that podcast. And now the new podcast I'm doing is called The Arc Party. And essentially, the idea of this is instead of a review podcast, it is um, pre-publication promotion with authors. So you have a book that's coming out. It's not out yet. I talk to you and um, we talk about the book and and just kind of get people aware of stuff before it's out so they can pre-order and engage with their libraries and stuff like that. Yeah. And so today we are going to be chatting with Max Booth. He will be releasing in a matter of days Abnormal Statistics, a short story collection from Apocalypse Party Press. And so, I mean, normally with Arc Party, you put these out quite a bit ahead of the release. I mean, you recently spoke to Cassandra Kaur, and their new book isn't coming out until May. But with right. Max, this is going to go live, and then the next day, boom, <laughs> you can buy abnormal statistics now it may be because i took quite a long time to actually have a date that was ready for us to record this it may not be that could be one of the reasons but anyway max is here now max how are you doing i just want to say i've been ready to do this for a while and rob has as well so uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's I'm hanging doing you great. Out. He's hanging you out. People can I'm doing awesome. re- read between the lines. I'm neither confirming nor denying the reason. So you, you can come up with your own conclusions. So you got abnormal statistics coming out in a few, few days. Uh... Yeah. So, I mean, how did this one come about? How did you first land the collection with apocalypse party press yeah so i became i knew, i became a real of apocalypse a few a few years ago when ben who who runs apocalypse he emailed me to just tell me basically that he was a fan of perpetual motion machine my press and how it had kind of inspired him to begin his own press because at the time I was also looking at a shitty nine to five job while also trying to do this press. He also has a, t- a similar type of job and he found it kind of motivational. And I thought that was a cool thing to read from someone. So they were always in the back of my mind and it helped that apocalypse releases really cool books like Negative Space by B.L. Yeagle and mm. Bonding by Maggie Seabilt. Most of the books I've read by Apocalypse are super cool, and they have a pretty just nice vibe to them that I enjoy. So I forget what led to me submitting a collection to them, but I knew I wanted to get one out. I didn't want to self-publish it like I've done a lot of my books recently, because I just don't have as much time, it seems. Um, So I was thinking of presses I thought might be interested, so I hit up Apocalypse to see if they might be interested, and I have a collection. And I think I mentioned the possibility of just doing a novella as well. Ben seemed interested, and I have all those, so I went through and I compiled a collection, and I sent it over. It was pretty long, also, it had a shitty title that I can't even remember now. It was a bad title. If I sent him the collection and he accepted it, and then as we were going through edits, we kind of discovered 
many of them had a theme of dysfunctional families. So once we realized this, it's something I didn't even think about until he pointed it out. But once this was something we both knew was in the collection, it made it really easy to go through and trim the collection quite a bit to cut away the stories that did not fit the theme. So I think the original collection was like 80,000 builds long and we cut it down to, I think like 51,000 and later on I finished the novella in the Anna death song. And originally I was just going to release it as a standalone, but I kind of had this epiphany that it was perfect for this collection because it was almost like, like a simile of every other silly vibe wise. And it just felt like it had a good home in that collection. So I hit up Ben, I sent him the uh, novella and I said, what do you think about including this in the collection? He liked it. He loved it. We put it in the collection and it shot up to like 78,000 rules, which is good because maybe 51,000 was not quite long enough in retrospect. So I'm pretty happy with the length it is now, and I'm I'm glad we uh, ended up cutting so much, which allowed room to add this novella. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of the collection, I feel that it's a very fair reflection of the kind of breadth of your writing style and story aesthetics, because, I mean, Indiana Death Sung, has to be up there with the absolute bleakest things that you've ever written. Um, I mean, there's still, there is still some humor in it, but you know, I think the, the darkness definitely overshadows that. Although I'd, I'd say having read the, the script as well, which are we allowed to talk about? (laughs) I, I mean, you wrote a script for it. Can we say that? Yeah, I've written I've written a script adaptation, but uh, it's not with anyone. So um, I just wrote mm. it um, on spec, and hopefully we will sell it to someone in the future. Yeah. So the the, the script for me, <clears throat> it seemed to have more comedic elements than you know the novella. The novella definitely was tonally darker, I would say, um, but. Then, I mean, in contrast to Indiana Death Song, you have stories like Fish, which is pretty much just like comedic <laughs> throughout. And I mean, it, it seems to be with your fiction, you know, you typically have these two modes where you've got like, uh, we need to do something is, you know, in that darker mode. But then you've got something like, carnivorous lunar activities which is much more comedic so I mean was that something you were conscious of when you and Ben were putting the collection together that you wanted to be able to showcase these two sides of your writing um I don't know hold on can you guys see and heal me I, I can. Have you? Did okay. you also I, get a little notification saying connection is lost, even yes. though? Yeah, it, it was yeah. not lost at all, but yeah, anyway. Fucking lying continue. piece of shit, computer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Got one too. Every, all of us did, apparently. Yeah. <clears throat> is that, I haven't used this app much. Have you? Do you guys get that often when you use Zencastle? It, okay. It, it very occasionally turns up, and obviously today was the day. <laughs> god damn fucking sandal days okay um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to remember what you asked me now okay, I was yeah. Asking about, oh, yeah okay. what the fuck is going on in the background <laughs> i mean i'm guessing that's just a dog i, I have dogs is it I have conan dogs. o'brien yeah yeah it was conan o'brien yeah okay i um i don't think it was something we discussed or I thought much about with this collection because most of my shield fiction tends to be on the bleak old side. And most of it, I don't think has a lot of comedy. Like I would say, yeah, there's some bits and pieces throughout that have comedic moments, 
but I would say my my uh, my novels, my my big books, they tend to have a lot more comedy in them because I, at least with me, most of my comedy tends to happen when I have a long amount of time to develop characters and you get to understand like how they behave and then you get to ha- you get to add these jokes through the dialogue and behaviors mm. but with uh, short fiction you don't really have that time to uh develop that way and plus with this collection i think i just wanted it to be like this is a whole collection. So yeah. that made it pretty easy to not include some of my comedic short stories because I do have some. Usually anytime I've written a, a, a comedic short story or flash fiction, it was feel like a public reading I was doing because mm-hmm. I think when you do a, like a, a reading, it should be comedic. So I've written a lot of stuff like that specifically with the intention of reading it out loud. But none of that's in the collection. And I can see how fish can be pretty funny. I don't think I intended it to be that way, but <laughs> I can also see how it just is funny. Like if that was made into a movie, I'm pretty sure it would be uh, not that serious because yeah. it's about a kid just fucking a woman who's menstruating endlessly <laughs> yeah it's definitely absurd and i think yeah. the absurdism leads to humor yeah 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 i particularly love your story note for fish because mo- most of the story notes you've got some <laughs> kind of long-winded uh, not long-winded long, long kind of answer as to how you came about this and i'm, I'm just gonna find the exact wording even though i pr- I pretty much know the sentence but with fish the story notes go i lost my virginity to an older woman on her period sometimes it's as simple as that folks <laughs> so i mean i think that's a pretty good lesson phil streel are you telling any expiring inspiring aspiring right old south tale um just, you know maybe they listen to this podcast for uh, advice on how to write and um, that's something i would uh, tell them you know the the most in- innocent uh experience could lead to a great story just such as losing your virginity to an old woman that will feel it you could write a story about monster lady who uh <laughs> corrupts a child into killing families <laughs> yeah why not yeah. i'll say a good and it's not good <laughs> it's a very specific <laughs> right I, mean, I, th- I, 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 th- I think the anecdote which was uh in on writing by stephen king too yeah <laughs> i mean Here, didn't are, he... uh, so about that though like <laughs> yeah <laughs> one not about that but about um I, from my perspective of reading this, uh, and and we'll get into this probably deeper when we start talking about some of the stories. But um, when I read some of this, I definitely picked up on the autobiographical nature of it. And so, like, and and obviously, you said that this was inspired by, you know, a real experience. And then my mind automatically starts asking, like, did the woman he lost his virginity to convince him to start murdering people or like, was that the line? You know what I'm saying? So like with this collection, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of stuff that seems like it's informed from you and it's obvious kind of usually where the barrier is, but sometimes it's like, uh, I don't know. I think pretty much anything I've written has that element to it of being recycled from my own life and then kind of Frankensteined into something else. Like with fish specifically, yes, I did end up killing a few kids, but (laughs) the names were different. So that's kind of like, you know, I'm able to be creative with it. It's just got to change the names. I mean, I don't have to, but like the names in real life just didn't seem that fun to read. So you want to change it so the reader's like, ah, this is, this is entertaining. <laughs> yeah. And I think with fish, as with 
I mean, all of your stories, like the, the pacing is great. You always have such a kind of sense of, you know, getting that story progressing from beat to beat. It, it's all very kind of lean, I guess, uh, what good old Richard Thomas would refer to as trimming the fat. And I mean, I, I think as well, there's a there's a definite sense of escalation because whilst it starts off as pretty comedic in my opinion, then like, you know, when the horror kicks in in that kind of final act, oh, it really <laughs> ramps up very quickly indeed. Oh, thank you. I am. Um, I'm glad you you picked up on that, Michael. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I mean, thank you. I pacing, I think, is something that's pretty essential, and I think it can be difficult to get right. But I don't know. Maybe just one way to do that is to have a lot of a lot of manic energy. So when you write the story, it kind of matches that at some point. Um, something I just remembered about fish, and I think it's kind of funny, is there's a section of that story that describes someone's face caving in like a rotting pumpkin. And I just remembered for a long time when I was a teenager, I would use that same description a lot. Specifically, mm. a rotting pumpkin colla collapsing to describe a face getting just crushed. I don't know what was going on with that. I, I think I just, like, I guess when you feel spaghetti ready and, and you come up with something, like, by your, yourself that isn't just mm. stolen from someone else, you kind of cling to that and you use it as much as possible. But I recall, like, re using that description quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Then the other day you uh, discovered the writing. Oh, oh, I've just spoiled. I've, spo <laughs> I've fucked up. I've fucked up your bit. Continue. Let's uh, it I wasn't a bit. Say that. I, uh, I, it also just hit me now as an afterthought that I do have a running pumpkin on my front pilch right now. I uh, it's from last Halloween. I, I forgot to do anything with it, and like last week, it was still fine. And then, like within a couple of days, it just fucking flattened to this black carcass. And I don't know what to do with it now. Yeah, I was any, on the phone tips? to you when you discovered that, and then <laughs> subsequently <laughs> saw the photo of the pumpkin aftermath. You yeah. can put that in the show My notes. Dogs keep trying to interested. eat it. You I don't wish I was on a laptop. It. I could just walk outside and show you, but I'm on a desktop. So I think if I unplugged it, I would lose video access. Yeah, that would. We'll take you at your <laughs> yeah, word, you definitely I think. would. Yeah. So, we, we like, for those watching, ima imagine this is a pumpkin. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> all right. I mean, we, with this collection, obviously, there was quite a bit of discussion then in terms of what to and what not to include, given that you submitted, what, over 100,000 words or so initially. So, I mean, what did that process look like? And were there any stories that Ben particularly wanted you not to include that you were adamant like no this absolutely goes in or vice versa no it was the opposite i think after we did it i came up with a list i think he also maybe came up with a list of ones he thought could be removed mm. and i'm 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 not really um precious about my writing usually so i mean if someone's well, not just anyone, but him specifically. I trusted him. He, I think he has good mm -hmm. taste, and he was publishing it. So anything he suggested, I was pretty quick to remove. And mm. um, some of mine, he was like, well, maybe we should keep this one. And I was like, oh, nah, let's just fucking cut it. Yeah. There was one that the last one we cut, it's called um, Flowers Blooming in the Season of Atrophy. 
and it was my really first propane publication. It was in uh, Michael Bailey's uh, Chiral Mad 2 anthology. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up cutting it. He thought maybe it should stay, but I decided to cut it because the, uh, well, not because of the plot. The plot is basically it's about a school shooting that happens. But it was a little too positive, I think, <laughs> which sounds funny. But it the the way it's written, it's written like a little bit too, I don't know, Disney and spiraling. It's about a school shooting that's prevented. But the way mm. it's written, it just didn't seem to fit the same vibe. And I don't think I would have written it that way now. And I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm still I look back fondly on it because of the the uh it being my really feels pro publication but beyond that i don't know going back and reading it again for the collection it just didn't sit right and the only other story that really comes to mind that we did leave but i was really on the fence about for the longest mm-hmm. time was a zombie story called uh, uh in the attic of the universe what the fuck is that story yeah. called Hell, yeah yeah that's, that's the title in the okay. attic of the universe so that's a super old story that I was afraid just wasn't written well. Um, I wrote it, I think, when I was a teenager. I can't remember now. Um, so I was afraid it was just wasn't the same quality, but Ben seemed to like it. And I, I liked the idea of having something from way back then in the collection for people reading to kind of like compile how hopefully my I have improved as a writer throughout the last decade or so. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that's okay. Like I love Stephen King collections, especially the, the feels like three or four collections of his and something that would be, always be cool is like seeing like the decades, each one was originally published in. It would, I always found it kind of neat to trace like the history of Stephen King's stories. Yeah. If I could say one thing about that particular zombie story, uh, I would say that, and this is just me reflecting on, cause I read the book about maybe a month ago. Um, it seems like that story has a lot of heart. Like it's got a lot more, um, uh, I don't know, like positive kind of vibes to like relationships, like in, you know, interactions between people, even though it's like a terrible situation. Um, and, and while you were describing it, I was thinking to myself, there's gotta be some kind of like hope somewhere in this book because a lot of it gets pretty bleak. So, um, that's, that's kind of like my first thought that I, that came to mind when you, when you were talking about it was there does seem to be a little bit more of like a positivity to that story than maybe a lot of the other ones. Yeah. I mean, I guess I hadn't grown yet as a rattle to the schedule, but <laughs> there was no hope. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's what I was thinking as Rob was saying. It. It's like, you know, you wrote that one when you were younger, so you were you were less jaded or one might say less aware yeah. of the world. So there was a little bit more optimism. And then as you got older, it's like, no, no. <laughs> it's isn't. pretty, I mean, looking back, I'm pretty fond of the premise it has. For those listening, the premise of this really is zombie apocalypse. It's a a man living in this attic with his child. It's a baby. And, oh shit, I forgot the premise. Uh, Isn't he bitten? (laughs) Yeah, he's bitten. He's been bitten. So he knows sooner or later he's he's going to become fucking zombified. And this baby is going to be left alone. So he has the uh, dilemma, like, what do I do? Do I just let this baby go and see what happens? Or do I shoot my baby and then uh, shoot myself? I mean, that's something I tend to um, approach a lot with many of these stories is coming up with this really fucked up dilemma or situation they've someone's found themselves in and exploring how they react, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think I probably found this more traumatic than I would have if I'd have read it before becoming a father, because I'm really trying to put myself in this situation and decide, well, what what the hell would I do? Because I mean, yeah, you've effectively 
got the ultimatum well do, do i take care of uh <laughs> this issue you know but and uh yeah the the, the baby will have be, be no more yeah. or do do i kind of exit and and hope or don't know that it's pretty unlikely that something good that, that you know will happen but yeah yeah it's uh, I'll tell you what just ended my brain as you were talking. You said ultimatum, and <laughs> you know, it showed to me that you know how some people say tomato, tomato, tomato. What right. if you did like ultimatum, ultimatum? I mean, that. <laughs> that's that's why I began laughing as you were talking because suddenly I couldn't stop thinking about that. I, I apologize, but um, this is the uh, ALC penalty, baby. This is what happens <laughs> when you get a little too uh, loose with the coffee. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, th thank you for sharing <laughs> that thought with us. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who else I could have told, so <laughs> I had no to tell somebody. No, one, no one's going to think of ultimatum the same way ever again. Yeah. Or ultimatum, ultimatum, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, Rob, if you're in this situation <clears throat> with your your hypothetical child, I mean, what what do you think you would do? Uh, all right, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. So I uh, I don't have my own children, but I've um, the person I've been dating for the last two and a half years has uh, kids that are eight and thirteen, mm -hmm. and uh, so I've known these kids for a couple of years now, and I really care about them. And the the older one recently was like tr chasing the cat or something like that, and then turned quickly and like hit their head on the door frame, and it was very frightening in the moment. Obviously, they ended up being fine, but we had to take them to the emergency room and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I'd never felt like such horror and such like a feeling of just I don't want this person to feel this way that. You know, two two years ago, if you asked me that question, I think my response would have been um, way different than now because, like, you never want to see your kid suffer, and so it is like this kind of impossible situation where it's like, I am I, is it weak to not do the thing to prevent future suffering, or is it weak to do the thing to like? There's there's no answer. So I, I think that two years ago, I would have been like, oh, it's easy. Just, you know, do the right thing and, and prevent the kid from suffering in the future. But now I don't know if I I don't know if I would be able to to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Michael? What would you do? I, I think that in general, despite whenever I encounter really difficult situations and I've, you know, I've had a few in the last few years, I'm a relentless optimist. So I just don't think, you know, I could kill the kid because there's going to be that bit of hope that something good might happen in the end. Um, I mean, Im imagine too, if you decide to kill the kid and you, you can feel yourself turning but then like it, you, you never actually fully turn. And then you realize later you have this rare mutation <laughs> that meant you could never turn. But uh, yeah. Oh, well, oh shit. Well, maybe it's like, oh, wait, being a zombie is awesome. I need to bite my kids so they can join me. This is actually pretty great. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, too, I mean, the, the optimism, even if I turn, it might be that like you know it's not zombies who discover the kid and i imagine if you had killed your kid yeah. and someone else were to discover them so yeah i think i'd uh i, I don't know what, what would you do like maybe barricade the room as much as you can but may, maybe also in the house be like you know write a note kid in bathroom because yeah like, I assume that like zombies aren't that good at reading and comprehending, but if a non-zombie turns up, oh, kid in bathroom. Okay, well, let's. <laughs> but let's... instead, it says, uh, "Kid, please, bathroom open." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a Walking Dead joke. Um, 
it reminds me now thinking about it um the end of the mist the film adaptation mm. have you guys both seen the movie i have yeah oh my god okay i don't know how to talk about this movie now never mind <laughs> Moving I was going to spoil the ending. <laughs> okay. So, if, you, if you're worried about spoiling it for me, don't worry about it. Go for it. All right. So, The Mist, it, um, it ends with um, the husband, the father. Um, he's driving away with uh, his kid and a bunch of other people who have survived this uh, apocalyptic uh, hell thing that's happening. They're driving into the mist, and they decide we'll just keep driving, but then they, uh, I think, ran out of gas, and they were surrounded by the mist and all the creatures around them, and they have a, a gun with enough bullets to kill everybody but one. So they decide, okay, the the, the man, he, he shoots everybody, including his son, and now it's just him. So he runs out after killing his fucking son and then sees, oh, the mist is going away and the government has come to save them all. So that just brought to mind that ending. And now it's really hilarious to me imagining like what the next scene was like. Like yeah. <laughs> him trying to explain <laughs> this mass homicide he committed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He probably went to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, spoilers on the mist. <laughs> it was good to call out spoilers after you talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So every breath is a choice. I, I, all I'm going to say is like, there is, there is one word in that story and it is the best word in the entire book. If you ask me, I did not see the ending of this story coming and the twist happens in the very last word. And mm -hmm. I got through this whole story and I got to that last word and I was like, yes, it was like the <laughs> most satisfying. Like, like I did not see it coming. And even like, so it was building and building and like, um, uh, so like the premise for people who are listening, who didn't read this already, um, is there's a guy who I'm on the right story, right? There's a guy yeah, who, um, yeah. th this guy breaks into his family's house and like, uh, rapes his, his wife and kills his wife and then kills their kid or no, I'm sorry. Um, gives the guy a choice. Uh, the guy walks in on all this happening, gives the guy the choice. Like he has to choose whether the, the guy kills the wife or the kid. Yeah. So like, that's the premise of the story. And then, um, without, uh, spoiling too much like you know this guy's life just kind of like crumbles apart after that and it's just this pathetic kind of sad sack person um, and the way that you ended the story though that turn that you take never saw it coming and it was just so perfect and powerful I was really impressed by um, the like how you really led me in the path of like this guy is just like trudging through this sad existence i never saw that ending coming and it was probably for me the most even though indiana death songs fucked me up crazy like mm -hmm. this story was probably had the most powerful moment for me in the whole book oh thank you um that i forget when i wrote it exactly but it had a difficult time getting accepted any place in fact the 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 anthology that didn't publish it it was accepted by someone who had rejected it like five years previously, but then they accepted it this time. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't have a lot of memories of where that idea even came from, but I do recall struggling a bit with what to do with it because I had the initial premise of someone has to make a decision of who dies, a wife or child, but I didn't know what to do beyond that. So I I remember once the the second half, the ending coming to mind, that's when everything clicked. I got pretty excited about writing it. But I, I do think I spent a long time trying to figure out what happens after the initial thing that happens happens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean maybe one reason as well that you found this one kind of more 
personally effective than Indiana Death Song is just like it's a premise that one can anyone can easily relate to. Whereas, I I guess with mm-hmm. Indiana Death Song, it whilst you know you can empathize to some level, unless you've had that kind of childhood, then that there's like that other layer that makes it harder to to fully put yourself in that position. But yeah, I mean, this premise specifically, I imagine, is something everyone has put themselves through. Like, it's a mind game almost. Yeah. Like, okay, of my family, who would I save? That's basically what this is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With that, the, but that second, mm-hmm. like, it, it's interesting that you say that it took you a while to come to that, like, uh, that conclusion, to come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah. and figure out what the ending of that story was going to be because um uh, masterful but like i can imagine you were just like struggling with that story and then one day you were just like this is it so yeah uh, i mean we have a super fucked up thing that happens but you can't that's just that can't be all that happens in this really it's going to be incomplete feeling right yeah exactly like they were like what's the point you just you're just giving a hypothetical but like the what you did yeah. with the end of it makes it more of a story makes it more yeah i agree thank you yeah in in terms of like you know coming up with endings is that like a lot of writers kind of tend to struggle with that is that something that is particularly difficult for you because you you generally fucking nail it. It does it like on on the page. It doesn't seem to be a difficult thing, but I know like how much we can kind of labor on to like sticking that ending and getting it right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think about endings a lot with a shield. Surely, I don't begin writing anything until I know the ending typically the ending comes first except in the example of every breath is a choice i had the beginning before i had an, an ending mm. but if i don't know the ending especially in the shield story it's just going to come across as this aimless thing i think but it's good to have like i mean i look at it like writing a joke you need mm. to have the punchline, even if the punch in this case, the punchline is usually something horrific. It is still a punchline mm. and you can't write the build up to that unless you know what it is. And then you can come up with the beginning and then everything else leading to that with books. I sometimes have an idea in mind. I usually have a vague sense of how I want it to, to end. I don't always have like a concrete idea with Indiana Death Song, no fucking idea how that was going to end, which is probably why it took me so long to write. If I mm-hmm. imagine if I had come up with an ending before I wrote it, I would have finished it quite quickly, but that wasn't the case. But yeah, I think endings, I mean, the ending is the last thing you read. So if it's a bad ending, you will not going to have good uh, memories of that story. Even a shitty story with a good ending is going to leave an okay impression on you. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to go back to something you you said earlier about when you're doing live readings, it's important to find a comedic piece. And that's something that, you know, I completely agree with. But if if you're doing something like promoting, you know, Indiana Death Song or we need to do something, so pr- pretty bleak stories, what what's your approach there? Would would you just read like a complete story on, on that kind of tour that's nothing to do with the book? Or would you yeah. take yeah. Yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot and I don't know what the right solution is because it's it's I agree. It's almost like false advertising, maybe like this is not the type of book you will going to be buying. Um, yeah, I've read one section of Indiana Death Song out loud to an audience and I think the audience liked it. I didn't enjoy the experience. Um, it was a 
so last year at a convention in Austin called Killcon, right. I read a section from it at that. Now, um, we haven't talked about this novella yet, but it was it's mostly about my own experience as a teenager with my uh, mom and dad. And the week of Killcon, my mom died. And then I went to Killcon and I read a section from it. And I think I was a fucking maniac as I was reading it. I was definitely on the village of just falling to pieces. And um, I guess being overly emotional is uh, a possibility when you are reading something super serious. And that could have its good sides, I think. But I don't tend to uh, write a lot of stuff that quite taps that way maybe i do i don't know i don't think i have enough pieces that you can read without context that have that type of emotional uh vein to poke but with comedy i don't know you you require less context i think when you're reading like a flash fiction comedic piece Mm. than you would something super bleak maybe it's also possible i'm just talking right now without thinking but i I think i'm making sense (laughs) um i'll give you an example of what i plan on reading um next week so i'm doing a few book related uh reading events next week and i to promote this collection and i plan on writing a new flash flash fiction piece i haven't written it yet but i have it in my head what i'm gonna write and it has nothing to do with this collection but I think it's going to be pretty funny. I'll, I'll tell you the, the story idea and what happens in it because it's never going to be published in any place. It's just going to be something I read out loud. So a while ago, I got obsessed with this tweet this woman posted. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing, but it's basically like this woman tweeted how hubby loves loves it when she puts three soft boiled eggs up a uh, vagina and then um, the husband then like licks up the egg juices, I think something like that. It's really fucking gross, but <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's amazing the way the, the vivid images that come to mind when I read this tweet. So the idea I have is I'm going to write a short story about this, a flash fiction about this man who also reads the tweet. He It's going to begin with them just joke, just laughing it out. Like, aha, that's a gross tweet. But then he's going to not be able to stop thinking about it. And he's going to begin joking with his wife. Like, <laughs> that would be crazy if you did that, right? But then it's going to not be just a joke. It's going to be him like, come on, we could try and it happens. They do it and he loves it. It's the best fucking thing in the universe. I mean, he's so obsessed with these egg juices that the <laughs> ending is going to be him crawling into his wife's uh, womb and living inside of it. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to read to promote uh, abnormal statistics. I don't <laughs> know ending. if that's the right move. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right move. But that's what I'm thinking. Okay. I think I'll call I mean, it three eggs. I, I, I thought you'd be calling it I can hold three, but yeah. <laughs> I knew as soon as you said this tweet I read, I knew exactly <laughs> where you were going. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know how that translates to people buying this collection. Like, I mean, someone might enjoy the reading, they buy this and get home and go, what the fuck is this? Well, I might be losing an audience by scaling away people with reading something like that because the collection isn't like that. But I don't know what else to do because I I think like task number one when doing a live reading is to entertain. I don't want to read anything that puts someone to sleep. So to me, the I need to come up with something fucking strange and hopefully funny and unforgettable and uh, three eggs i believe is going to be that type of story yeah yeah i i feel yeah. i feel like if you do that it's like look if, if you've enjoyed this reading and you're buying the book based on that maybe start by reading fish you know, because if you if you bought it specifically because of free eggs, and then you start with Indiana Death Song, it's like, 
completely different mood. So I, I, I reckon... Not a single egg in that book. No, no. eggs in, in the uh, death song at all. Yeah. That's, that's true. Pretty odd. But, but I mean, the, the only other way yeah. you could do it is if you've got the live reading. And if, if you can somehow do two extracts, I don't know if, like, is, is this going to be, like, an interview with readings and, like, you know, you can stand up, do one reading about 10 minutes later, you do another. I mean, the extract that probably would be most comedic is um, the elevator scene. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when it again kind of yeah, when I, when I did yeah. um, when I did the Kittlecon, I read two sections. I read that scene to make people yeah. laugh, and then I read a section when uh, oh, I guess I can't talk about it, but I read a, a much sadder section later on in the novella, and I think that was a pretty good like one-two punch. You get them laughing, and then they will paying attention and then you can go in for the sad shit so i do think there is a place for sad stuff to read but you do need to hook them before you can like get them feeling anything yeah yeah and i i I think you know with a live reading you want to entertain the people it's a different experience than just like you know sitting down and reading the book yourself and yeah i've I've had times Mm -hmm. where i've gone to readings and very accomplished writers have just like read um like a section of supernatural horror where it's very dense it's very literary <laughs> but it's say just supernatural fanfic <laughs> no no <laughs> but it you know just just reading this very kind of prose heavy description uh, it, it it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't really feel like it translates well for a live reading that's not where i'm gonna get the most out of that but if you've got something comedic or you've got something dialogue heavy then you're gonna get my attention yeah even the times i've read like sections from a book that was published i always take that section into a real document and revise it so it makes more sense to read out loud yeah Yeah. I have, a, I have a speech impediment, so usually when I do that, I try to remove anything that I know I'm not going to say correctly. Or well, if I have too much exposition, I cut that and just like just mm-hmm. like the, the fucking the bill bones of what I need to get across is what I read out loud. That's exactly what I'd me say, and Bob uh, did for the uh, launch of their watching. I took a section between the protagonist and the PI character. And I just basically formatted it like a script. And it's like, right, that's what Mm -hmm. we're reading. (laughs) Rob. Uh, And and this is a David James Keaton story. So take that with however much salt you need to take that with. But um, one thing I've noticed about him with live readings, because I've attended several uh, of his, is that um, sometimes he'll just do some sort of, this is something that happened to me recently, you know, as, as like a thing he's talking about before he goes into a story. So like, I think if you're going just grim, if you had some sort of entertaining anecdote that was real life before going into just grim, like that could be a way to soften up the crowd without like, you know, um, yeah. necessarily having another piece because like he really got, he, there was one time in Chicago where he got basically the whole audience, like just, really railing against the um, Chicago uh, uh, parking authority people because he had this really compelling story about like getting his car towed. And then he went into the thing he was, he has his actual story. So like, yeah, I think that too could be a way to hook people in and get them on your side before. But I, here, here's the thing uh, caveat. I don't, I'm not an author. I never have to stand up and read one of my things. So like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I take that, Take that how you will, but I I thought Keaton yeah. was good at that as far as like being entertaining and get the audience on your side. Yeah, that sounds like a good method. I've never met Keaton. I've never seen him read, but just his own like his style of prose feels really conversational. So I bet oh, yeah. you, yeah, he's a he he probably does great public readings. Something I've been debating trying to do one day soon at at, at some event is doing uh, an, an improv reading. Basically, just having someone tell me like a few things about what Australia could be about, and just fucking tell Australia for ten minutes. I'm pretty sure I could do it, but it just depends when. 
because I think that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, I love that idea, and anything that's going to make for a unique experience as well. It, you know, that's a reason to go to that reading. And yeah, what you're describing, yeah. it almost has a kind of whose line is it anyway kind of old TV comedy style to it. Yeah, I'd be I'd be totally up for like an event like that where you've got three or four readers and they're each given a different prompt. I mean, maybe you take like, you know, the, the prompt out of a hat. Oh, what have I got? Shit, three <laughs> eggs. But, you know, it could, could be any anything. Why are they so um, wet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that called a? I think that's called like an exquisite culps, right? When you continue someone else's story. Yes. Mm, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. A any piece of art that like one person starts it and then like someone picks up where they left off. Yeah. Yeah. It would be fun to do that, but also have someone else assigned just for editing, like if. Mm. So they can just yell, stop, and run out and go, <laughs> okay, this is real game. This is not real game. Let's do this again. I guess that's <laughs> like a movie direct almost, but still, that could be a fun yeah. bit to do on stage. Maybe I'll do that. I do a monthly show in Austin called The Ghoulish Show. I have uh, people come out and do performances on stage, usually comedic to a crowd. So now I'm thinking that would be a good uh, event, a good time to do that one of these days at that show is to do a, a live uh, exquisite culps. So thanks for the idea, folks. Yeah, yeah. God, if nice. we wanted to practice it, we could probably get like a number of writers together and just do do one of these on a podcast to see like how does it logistically work. And then depending how well it does or does not work would depend on whether we ever air it. <laughs> It's fair. I just want to say, I've been ready to do this for a while, and Rob has as well, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's I'm doing great. Out. He's hanging you out. People can I'm doing awesome. re read between the lines. I'm neither confirming nor denying the reason. So you, you can come up with your own conclusions. But I mean, I, I would argue honestly, it's, it's, you live you live in Japan, so you yeah. been recording this even closer to the release date than we are. <laughs> I know, I know, absolutely disgraceful. I mean, I, I was going to say, you know, but doesn't it make sense to be talking to someone when you can actually buy the book? But I'm not going to say that because then, you know, that would be hanging out my friend Rob Olson. It's like, so you just dissed the entire concept of his podcast in the first few minutes. So that's why I haven't said that. Well, the our Venn diagram <laughs> just doesn't really overlap much. Like I handle pre-release and you handle at or after release and then you know there's just that little maybe a little overlap but and i um, handle uh, release i yeah. mainly specify in releasing that's my thing is i release i'm not a fan of the pre-release or the post-release but the act of <laughs> releasing i'm pretty much a fan of i think yeah. if i had you know i mean obviously release is the best but if i had to you know, also do a lot of pre-releasing <laughs> or post-releasing. I mean, post-release is probably better, like particularly if there's a lot of pre-release. So the thing with post-release <laughs> is I'm usually left kind of disappointed and ashamed. And pre-release can be fun, like especially like if you're right on the edge of pre-release, then you stop. But then after so long, you just kind of like lose feeling in like the act of releasing. And then it's like, ah, what's the point of even continuing? But right in those seconds of release, that's that's the best. Yeah, I can see well, from your face. So we know people, how you're going to feel. Yeah. Yeah. People watching I'm talking the video about will see. That <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking. Yeah. Okay. 
time to change this podcast to the cum penalty, right? Right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> this is why you invited me or, on the show. Or this is cum, I guess? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Are you regret your decision to invite me on as the the co-host for this particular episode of Arc Party. I'll, I'll be honest, if we'd have been speaking to Joe Lansdale, this isn't this isn't how the episode would have started. Yeah, that's I'm true. I'm gonna get Joe Lansdale on my podcast. I'm gonna ask him. He's gonna say yeah, because he's he just I know him. And I'm gonna get him to talk about cum. I spilled a fucking <laughs> god. I am, that's my new mission, is to get Joe Lansdale to do a podcast where we mostly talk about ejaculate. I think I can make it happen. I mean, if anyone can, it's that's my That's my edge. I will do it if we, uh, if we sell, um, I don't know, a thousand pr- copies of this book. Yeah, I'll get Joe Lansdale to talk about cum. Is there a timeline that these copies have to be sold, or is it just at any point? Yeah, by uh, by June ninth, obviously. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Six six nine. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, I guess I guess Neville countries it would be nine six, but I'm I'm in the United States, so six nine. Yeah. So you're giving people you, till you, September sixth, then? I mean, in they the happen UK. until September eleventh. <laughs> Oh, God. The deadline is at nine eleven. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, Michael, Rob. I'm letting you steer this thing. So, yeah. Well, I think now we should did, did, jump. Oh, I thought you were letting me steer. Did this you want to? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> dealing this, this shit. Like the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, tell me what you'd like to do next, because I think that I'm just going to agree with it, but what would you like to do next? <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> tell me what. That's what I was I going to I got this, guys. I got Max this. Max got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> next up, <laughs> uh, what would you like to talk about, Michael? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah, I was right. Uh, how have you guys been? What's life like? Doing any fun projects lately, guys? I'm the host now, I guess. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I will, I will, I'm going to cut in and say, and this can be cut out because this is kind of like maybe a little inside, but when I pitched the idea of doing this, Michael was like, hey, I don't know how this is going to work because I'm like, a, I lead my thing and you lead your thing and you know, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, and I think this is exactly what Michael was worried about was this specific <laughs> moment. So it almost uh, it makes happens. me happy that it happened because yeah. if, it hit, if it hadn't, then it'd be like, oh, you know, but like, so it did. So that, that's good. You know what they say, you get three <laughs> like, podcast hosts in one room is a lot of, oh, you, you go ahead. That's what's happening with all of us right yeah. now. Yep. That's the age old saying. That's <laughs> the age. <laughs> time immemorial I mean I, I was gonna <laughs> lead I was gonna lead on to the next topic but the fact that you stop to ask me what I want to talk about would imply to me that there's something that you want to talk about Rob so what do you want to talk about oh I mean I, I think that the thing I came most prepared to do was like kind of throw in my insights about individual stories, but I didn't know how much we were going to dive into individual stories versus like doing other stuff. So if that's something that we're reserving for later on in the discussion, I'm just, all the chambers are loaded, man. I'm just letting you know. He's ready to <laughs> release. <laughs> it's release time. <laughs> yeah. I can see that <laughs> pre-release leaking from a man. Let's do it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. You guys know I'm talking about cum, right? <laughs> the talk has got very excited about the pre-release. Um, oh, <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes in podcasting, your guest just walks off. That just walks, happened. yeah, unceremoniously. Um, yeah, yeah, that's live podcasting for you. Sometimes the guest has enough. Sorry about that. that. 
<laughs> it's okay. I did, think did, maybe did, someone did, rang the jewel bell or something. That's a, a more sensible <laughs> suggestion as to what happened and where I was going. I was going to tie in what we've been talking about. And yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, he okay. can't come. He's been cl- snipped. <sighs> Is that one of the words you can't say around your dog? You have to like spell it out so they don't know that's the word you're saying. Come, but if you, I'm constantly but if you, saying C U M. Yeah, yeah, it's your whole dilemma how to spell come. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we've had podcast episodes about this, haven't we? Yeah, me, me and you, we genuinely like the C U M C O M E discussion. It, I mean that. Yeah. Is, so for those listening what i think we decided on c-u-m is come as a noun c-o-m-e is come as a verb and uh c-o-m-e a s y o u a l e is a nirvana song <laughs> for fuck's sake yeah. <laughs> an important <laughs> distinction yeah yes yes it i is. am on file today that was not planned it's fucking spontaneous next question let's go i got it next question is for rob do you have like a remote control webcam <laughs> what just happened yeah yeah <laughs> Nice. Yeah, so this is a combination. It's it's a confluence of two situations. So first of all, sometimes my office chair just goes like it lowers on its own. Yeah, I almost said goes down, but I knew how that was going to go. Uh, so yes, I do have a remote controlled webcam, and um, nice. so like I can kind of modify where it's looking. So I just wanted to make sure I was still framed up pretty nicely, even though my chair betrayed me. Yeah. Now, assuming that this goes into the final episode, and that might be a fairly big <laughs> assumption that this isn't edited out, <laughs> then it might be a kind of good time to make people aware that we have video versions of the podcast as well, because we're, yeah. we're making quite a lot of references to what is visually going on. So I, I imagine, too, that the kind of broadcast is going to be slightly different depending on whether you're viewing the This Is Horror YouTube or the ARC Party YouTube. Because, I mean, with us, we go for, like, whoever's speaking, the camera is on them. But if I don't know what your plan is, but if you're going to actually edit it together as you usually do, then you're going to see all cameras for your view, which actually... I mean, I wouldn't normally direct <laughs> my listeners or viewers away from, you know, my channel. <laughs> but I think that might be better, particularly because there's been times, particularly at the start and indeed now as I'm talking, where Max is just doing some weird fucking shit. Uh, are you going to yeah. miss out on that if you just oh, yeah. got to the Cesaro yeah, one? Yeah, like, yeah, when we were when we were talking, he was just like pretending to read the book, or maybe he was actually reading the book. Yeah, so the video video editions are going to be yeah a little bit a little bit extra for you for sure. Yeah, Hi. yeah. And, oh, hey, Max. Hello, Max. Hi. I didn't even acknowledge that you you disappeared for <laughs> audio. Did you see what happened? Um, I, I, I saw you leave glasses. the room, and uh, yeah, you you had oh, he's off again. <laughs> This is, this is quite the video presentation. Um, well, in terms of <laughs> in terms of the next segment, okay, guys, welcome back. Um, feel free to leave that in. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I uh, I vomited the coffee out of my nose all over myself. Seriously, that's what just happened. Why didn't you do that on camera? Hang on, oh, hold, now hold, I can't hear him. Can your, you hear your him? Your microphone has fucked. Can you hear him? <laughs> okay. I, uh, it went all over the ground, all over my clothes. It was disgusting. All because I said next question, and you said next question is for Rob, and I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. And I just fucking shot it out of every little fist on my face. Oh my god, that was gross. See what you well, those only Rob, listening to the you, podcast. You hadn't used your webcam. Is this a man? 
Maybe. Well, those only pro- listening. Yeah. Uh, just some um, some context for the listeners only. I've changed clothes mid podcast. Ridiculous. True. Yeah. Because from, Michael yeah. said the next question is for Rob. That was it. <laughs> for the record, we're all three of us professional, like experienced <laughs> podcasters. Like we all know what we're doing, and we have a lot of experience. So, yeah taking my socks off now because they have gotten soggy with coffee vomit yeah yeah i I mean that was one of the stories yeah (sighs) wasn't expecting any i mean i didn't plan that to happen i'm not going to apologize because i believe it will make podcast gold but um that's what happened it is uh, truly astounding (laughs) and perhaps marginally worrying that if you kind of total the podcast experience that the three of us have together, it must be very close to three decades. And this is a, this is what cumulative three decades of podcasting will get you. <laughs> Coffee on Shit, the maybe. I think I began, I began podcasting, I think, in 2017. What about you guys? So this is how I started in February 2013. April 2011. Yeah. So, so uh, I've got nah, 12, nah. 12, almost 13 years. Wow. Has anyone ever vomited a coffee on the podcast? No. My wow. building was on fire one time. Not the same. <laughs> yeah. It might not be the same, and it wasn't the direction that I planned on taking this, but you got to tell us the story there. <laughs> That well, I have this kind of thing. I was thinking about this because, like, um, there has been some uh, drama in the apartment below me, and I was like, if there's gunfire or something, I don't know if I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and just like continue recording. Um, but I was in, I was living in Vermont at the time, Vermont. and um, I was living in this like five story building, and um, uh, it was right before uh, someone that we were interviewing was about to join the call. No, they had just joined the call, but we hadn't started the actual interview yet. And all of a sudden there's just this like alarm sound. Uh, and um, I knew it was in my building and Livius is like, what's that noise? And I was like kind of more annoyed than anything. Cause everything was set and we were ready to go and we're just doing this thing. And it was like the, the fire alarms going off. So I had to like get up and go downstairs and find out what was going on. Someone's kitchen was on fire or something like that, but it was nothing where I had to evacuate. So I was like, let's just do this. Cause like the fire alarm, had stopped going so that it wasn't going to affect the audio. So like someone's kitchen was on fire, but I just pushed through it. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> and nothing I'm stops me awesome. from podcasting, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, it occurs to me now that what happened with me could be described as a release and now we only <laughs> post release. And now I don't feel great. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a little ashamed to be honest. I, yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've all had yeah. post-release shame at some point in our life. So I, I think yeah. this is going to be a bit that a lot of our listeners can connect with. So that's good. You know, I hope want... some of the release got um, refilled on the video. I don't know how much of it was on my cam. But it came right out of my mouth and my nose. That was painful. Well... I will... You've had painful releases, right? Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a hill podcast, right? We can talk about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, to think that about 15 minutes ago we were going to jump into another story and it all got derailed <laughs> with one simple question. It's my fault. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. We've me. talked about fish and the zombie story, right? Yeah. So, uh, isn't, uh, what else isn't that all you want to, to promote? I mean, yes. <laughs> all right. You know, I'll, I'll, what, can I take the reins on this? Because, like, I have a then. story that I need to talk about. So, oh, God. Um, <laughs> what do you need to talk about? Oh, no, it's okay. one of the stories in the, in the book. book so. I thought you were just going to tell us yeah, some yeah. event from your life. 
so yeah, by the way, this one time. No, uh uh Oh, now I gotta find it. Is it every breath is a choice? Is that the one? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh hang on. I want to make sure that's the right one. Uh yeah. So every breath is a choice. 